Well, my name is Sabrina, and uh, um, I'm from World One. I work at the international program in the international programs area. So what we do basically is uh, working with uh, uh, international partners. And in my specific role, I, I support movements and organizations from the global south that are part of the uh, international movement of, for food sovereignty. So I, what I wanted to do today is a little bit an introduction of, uh, of uh, our summary, a summary of what has been our um, work uh, based on the food sovereignty, the food sovereignty report that we published recently, which is called Profiting from Hunger. And uh, you can also find it on our website. And uh, so these are just some, uh, some uh, extracts of, uh, of, of the report. So as you can see, um, one of the most uh, scary figures is that uh, the world hunger is once again on the rise and the follow following the numbers of those experiencing hunger falling between 2009 and 2013, uh, this trend now has reversed and the global hunger is increasing again year on year. And in 2021, more people were affected by hunger than in 2020. Uh, and this, this despite a 300% increase in global food production since the mid 1960s. Uh, uh, so something is going wrong. And mal malnutrition is a leading factor that contributes to uh, a high reduced uh, life expectancy. Um, in strictly economic terms, what we have learned also from the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, and the food crisis that derived from it was that the food prices are simultaneously too low for producers and sometimes high for consumers and are very prone to fluctuations. Another thing that uh, we need to highlight is that the current industrial food system only produces about 30% of the world's food and 70%, 75% of the global agricultural land is currently exploited by agribusiness companies that produce export-oriented commodities. And uh, um, if you can go to slide, no, second slide. Uh, so today um, there is uh, uh, this uh, crisis of malnutrition. 3.1 billion people cannot afford a healthy diet in 2020. And uh, this, as you can see, has uh, increased dramatically since the pandemic. Uh, next slide. Uh, so what I was saying uh, is that um, the, the issue of, um, of hunger is not related with the quantity of food that we are producing, because at the moment the world is already grows more than enough food to feed everyone, almost twice over uh, the, the the needed calories, uh, an average uh, calorie, 2,250 calories per person per day, and the food grown globally is 6,000 calories per person per day. So the pr problem at the moment is not uh, that uh, we need to produce more food for the growing population, which is a, a common uh, um, phrase that we hear uh, sometimes. Uh, but uh, uh, the problem is the access to food, how that food is produced, what type of food is produced, and how this food is distributed around the world. Then go to the next slide. Uh, we live in a series of multiple crises, uh, as I was saying, and all these crises are interconnected. So we have the crisis of malnutrition, the crisis of hunger, and uh, the crisis uh, of um, of, uh, of war, and that is another one. And uh, for example, in the in the in the case of the Ukraine war, uh, there have been a lot of speculation with food. Hedge funds and financial speculators have made obscene profits by betting on hunger. And the start of the green war, financial investors are piled into grains and commodities in large numbers. And then they capitalize on uncertainty and rising food prices. And now they have it, the jack. Um, this is not gold or silver that we're talking about. It's the people's daily bread. And they're driving up food prices uh, driving up the food prices affects millions of billions of people around the world. 
it is a scandal and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. But the deregulation that has happened, particularly in the last decade and the last uh, in the last decades, has enabled the excessive speculation on food and also on land. We will see to take place. Um, uh, Yemen, the war in Yemen is also another case of uh, the impact of uh, war um, on um, on food security on ac access to food. Uh, the next one, and then another of the crises uh, that uh, are mentioned is the crisis of uh, of climate. Um, according to the UNHCR, uh, the weather hazards have displaced 24.9 million people across 140 countries only in 2019. And many of them were people uh, living in rural areas, so small scale farmers who, uh, who didn't build uh, resilience, enough resilience, agricultural resilience, and uh, uh, the increased heat waves, droughts, and floods from this climate breakdown are already exposing millions of small order farmers around the world to acute food insecurity, and particularly the global south. And some countries in the global south, south are more affected. This, for example, is a picture taken after a cyclone in, in Bangladesh. And uh, so there is, uh, uh, on one hand, uh, a serious impact of climate on food production, but at the same time, on the other hand, the industrial food system that we are living, that we're experiencing, is one of the main responsible of this current uh, climate crisis. Um, between 21% and 37% of the global carbon emissions are caused, that, that are caused by human activity come from the agri-food system. And there are studies from FAO uh, that uh, say that the predicted greatest future increases in the emissions of the agri-food sector will come from global supply chains rather than from farming itself. So the way that the, the, the international trade of food and the uh, international food system is structured is uh, increasingly contributing to, to the climate countries. Um, the, um, next slide. So this is an example uh, of Bangladesh uh, where we, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, that one. Um, uh, I'm mentioning Bangladesh because it's one of the countries that we work. Uh, uh, we work. We have uh, two two partners over there, uh, unions of farm workers and uh, small order farmers, and they are implementing every day um, climate adaptive agriculture uh, strategies uh, because uh, Bangladesh is one of the uh, most um, vulnerable countries to climate change. And if uh, if temperatures rise uh, above the two, two degrees, there are predictions that there may be a 17% land loss in the coastal areas, and also great reduction of 60 yeah. of um, of potato and wheat production, and also 21 million people displaced. Basically, all the people living on the coastal areas. But paradoxically, uh, this country is one that. It, contributes the less to the least to the to the climate crisis if you can see on the uh, image on the right the carbon dioxide emission uh, tons per capita uh, you can see that uh, 0 0.6 tons uh, are emitted by Bangladesh and 14.7 tons are emitted by the United States so this is an example of the injustice of the distribution of the emissions and then the impact and uh, the next slide. Uh, so another another trend that we have seen in the last decade is the uh, increased uh, concentration of uh, corp uh, corporate powers in the food systems. Uh, be before we had uh, corporations dedicated to pesticides, seeds, etc. And now the the between 2008 and 2018, we have seen increasingly um, corporate majors that consolidate areas that were previously separated. For example, uh, major corporates such as Bayer and Monsanto, uh, Bayer uh, Pharmaceutical and Monsanto uh, seeds and, um, and agrochemicals have simply become Bayer. Dow and DuPont are now Corteva AgriScience and ChemChina has acquired uh, Syngenta, uh, which is also uh, 
has an important uh, presence also in, in the United Kingdom. And another uh, thing that we have uh, seen is the increased profits that this corporation have, uh, have gained, uh, particularly after the, um, the pandemic. An example is the ABCD group, which is the main uh, agricultural grain traders uh, in the in the world, uh, they are called uh, like this because of their initials, Archer, Daniels, Midland, Bonji, Cargill, and Dreyfus. Um, so these are four corporations that have historically influenced the supply and the prices of agricultural commodities. And uh, they have experienced great profits since the pandemic. And right now the landscape is changing also because new um, uh, powerful corporations are popping up. Uh, like uh, Kofco in China and a new one um, in India. However, you know the big lion part is still played by by those by these key corporations based in global north um, countries, and they control the trade of uh, the most important commodities uh, in the world: uh, from wheat, corn, soybeans, and then also uh, other agricultural or raw materials, sugar, palm oil, rice, etc. And the next, uh, another trend that we have uh, uh, witnessed is that uh, it's, it's a new trend is that the um, asset management companies have seen that this uh, um, um, a, a food and agriculture has become an interesting investment uh, space. Uh, so this is pre-mergers, but the increase of shares of uh, the interest has increased even more. Um, this is an example of the percentage of shares in agribusinesses that are owned by major finance companies, for example, for example BlackRock, uh, Capital Group, and Fidelity, they have Vanguard, they're all um, asset management companies that have funds invested in uh, um, agro, um, agrochemical corporations and seed corporations. Uh, this concentration of power has increased uh, recently even more. The next uh, slide. Uh, another um, important trend that we have uh, noticed is that the, since the 2007 uh, 2008 world financial crisis, this has affected mainly the real estate market, but so the global financial markets, they have repurposed their investment portfolios and they try to diversify into new projects. And so what the financial players have done, such as investment banks, the asset management companies, insurance policies, insurance companies, venture capital funds, pension funds, uh, they have uh, now penetrated in different sectors of the com economy. And in financial markets, where they were more up absent before, and one of them is the agricultural sector, particularly uh, the land. Uh, you can see how the investment funds have increased uh, radically since 2005 up to now. So there is increasing interest in uh, farmland around the world, and farmland uh, is seen as a not as a human right, but as an asset, as an asset to to own and speculate with. So the world's common goods like water, land have been transformed into investment portfolios and opportunities to derivatives, future contracts, and in entering the speculation market. So this has happened especially in the last 20 years when they have liberalized the future markets and that means that speculators can now make more money. Uh, so banks are also betting on stable food prices in these unregulated financial markets and they're earning large profits. And those who pay uh, are at the end always those who produce the food and those at the end of the chain were the people who uh, go to the supermarket and buy the food and see their prices increase. Um, the, the problem of this model, uh, this financialization of agriculture is that it's sold and this industrial food system sees the whole food as a commodity and land as an asset and not as a human right. Um, the next one. Uh, so yes, uh, this base is more in this um, industrial agriculture model is based on uh, the principles of the green revolution that was 
probably useful 60 years ago after the, the Second World War, but it had terrible um, impacts in terms of uh, so, socio-economical impacts and in terms of um, health of the soil, health of, and, and biodiversity. Um, it's a model that has been existing for the last 70 years, so it's something that needs to to change and very soon because it's not sustainable anymore. And this is a photo of uh, in a, an example of um, what it means industrial food system, um, monoculture for export. This is an example of the soy cultivation and how it is encroaching in the Amazon rainforest uh, in Brazil. Uh, next one. Another example, I just these are just quick example uh, taken from also from the work of our partners in the south. Uh, in the top uh, is a photo of uh, how it's fumigated, um, pesticides and agrotoxics are fumigated. Um, they're basically fumigated from, from a plane. So they, they just fumigate thousands of hectares um, of soy, and, but then they don't care if there is a rural school or a village, etc. They just for, uh, fumigate everywhere. And this has uh, in, a terrible impact on the health of the communities, on the quality of the soil and the biodiversity. And it, um, it has had uh, um, a terrible impact for the last 30 years, particularly in the area of Brazil, Argentina, and Paraguay. Um, the photo below instead is, uh, is uh, the model of plantation and it's been taken with the drawn by one of our partners. The, the, the trees that you see below are um, uh, oil palm trees and the top is a rainforest. And this shows how uh, a corporation is slowly encroaching um, uh, with um, the monoculture plantation into the rainforest. But this is a good story because they managed to stop the advancement of, of this plantation and, uh, and put an end because it was an illegal encroachment. Um, but this is another uh, model of uh, um, industrial agriculture imposed global South countries. And I'm saying imposed because it's a policy that has been uh, imposed particularly since the 1970s to many countries in the South. And it's a model that in which many countries rely because it's one of the ways that they can get uh, for an exchange. Please go ahead. Another uh, 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 of the factors of this model and how uh, this global food system is organized is the employment of precarious and underpaid workers in the global north and also in the south. In the north, many times when it comes to the to the agricultural agri supply chain, um, we're talking about uh, foreign workers uh, with precarious contracts and maybe uh, precarious immigration status. And um, and here uh, this photo is about uh, Moroccan workers in the export farms in the south of Morocco. The top photo and below is a plantation in Sri Lanka of tea. The next one. And then the UK, um, yeah, what I already mentioned, underpaid workers in food factories, low wage and miserable housing conditions. Um, the next one. Uh, well, I, I think I'm going to go quickly with this because uh, we have people that have more uh, knowledge about the, the UK sector. Uh, I just basically wanted to mention that rely, the UK relies heavily on, on trade deals to bring the food uh, that they consume. And uh, Morocco is an example um, where we have partners uh, of a trade union working uh, with um, uh, farm workers in the berry and tomato uh, export sector. Uh, but um, I'm going to skip this part uh, because we have an um, expert talking on, on the UK today. Um, the next, uh, next. So I wanted to uh, focus a little bit on the solutions and the solutions that are brought forward by um, the movements uh, that we work with. Uh, these movements are 
grassroots movements of farmers, smallholder farmers, peasant farmers, and uh, farm workers uh, from the global south and from Europe too. And most of them are members of the network La Via Campesina, uh, which is a network that was born 25 years ago. Um, and um, they are uh, bringing forward the demands uh, based on the principle of the food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is the solution for this movement and it's a, it has a series of principles. And uh, the next one. So basically what food sovereignty is, food sovereignty is an alternative food system that is based on the fundamental right of all peoples, nations and states to control food and agricultural systems and policies, ensuring that everyone has an adequate, affordable, nutritious, and culturally appropriate food. These principles have been declared in 1996 as a result of peasant movement struggles from around the world, particularly in the global south. And there are six main principles that define this concept of food sovereignty. Food for people, so the right to food, values food providers, localizes food systems as much as possible, food control over land, water, and other natural resources on the food producers and not on corporations, and uh, builds knowledge and skills of producers and work, and finally works with nature, which with nature means uh, basically agroecology, peasant agroecology, agroforestry, and other um, forms of agriculture that uh, work with nature. Um, uh, the next one. So uh, just to conclude, what I wanted to show, um, are, these are some of the solutions that uh, and the, the demands that the movements have come for, particularly since the, since the um, uh, pandemic and since the um, food crisis that has hit the, basically the globe uh, since uh, the last year and a half. So these are some of the months, and you can also read more on our report, and also you can visit the, uh, the website of La Via Campesina, where they have the global demands and uh, that are uh, coming from the grassroots, from the movements, and some, some, and I'm just mentioning some of them. And these are global demands, and I'm mentioning them because I think that the UK as a important country in the global north can play a key role, particularly when it comes to trade when it comes to that. Uh, so uh, one of them is the end of speculation of food, the suspension of trading food products on the stock market. So particularly that terrible deregulation that has happened in the last 20 years. New food governments, new food governance. This means um, stopping the encroachment of corporations into UN's, uh, UN spaces and the influence that the corporations are having increasingly on this United Nations state, uh, United Nations spaces, where instead civil society should uh, have a much stronger voice. Uh, forbid the use of agricultural products to produce agrofuel or energy, because this reduces the amount of land available for, for smallholder farmers around the world. Bring a moratorium on the payment of foreign debt of global South countries. Uh, promote real sovereignty for countries in the South. And this means including monetary sovereignty because this is the uh, um, vicious circle in which many global South countries are. They can't stop the plantation model and the export model because it's their main source of income to bring foreign currency like US dollars and euros. And it's those foreign currencies that they need in order to trade and pay the debt. So that, uh, it's it's a vicious circle that is very difficult to stop unless the whole economic global structure changes and more sovereignty for those countries brought forward. A radical change in international trade order and a stronger localization of food systems, so territorial markets, food co-ops, changing public procurement, popular and integral agrarian reform, so redistribution of land for those who produce the food and because there has been an increasing concentration land grabs all around the world, particularly in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, transition from monocultures and heavy use of chemical pesticides and fertilizers to a model of peasant agroecology. So land rights on one hand and agriculture uh, that works with nature. Agroecology alone is not enough. 
because it can be done also by a large corporation who is doing some greenwashing. And the next slide, I'm almost finished. Uh, quickly, a global moratorium on dangerous technologies that threatens humanity, such as geoengineering, GMOs, uh, and cellular meat, lab grown meat, which is uh, a fashion in these days. Um, uh, promotional low cost techniques that increase peasant autonomy and peasant seed, seed sovereignty. Development of public policies to ensure new relationship between those who produce food and those who consume. Climate adaptation in agriculture, uh, recognizing the existence of climate debt, and uh, rejecting false solutions uh, for climate like carbon offsetting, carbon markets um, that are all greenwashing uh, strategies of large corporations at the moment. And the next one, uh, I skip the UK because uh, I leave it uh, for later. And the next one. So I'm just keeping uh, here some, some suggestions how to take actions. So get engaged locally, support alternative way producing and distributing food, but also for, for general alliance. Don't stop being internationalist, even the, during moments of crisis like today, uh, we need to keep the hope high and we need to keep the, uh, the solidarity with the global South and on international level, uh, because those are the moments in which they really need uh, more solidarity. So anti-imperialism, uh, commit political sovereignty of global South countries, uh, sign and share petitions in solidarity with workers in the South, for example, those who work in export-oriented farms that export to the UK uh, against unfair trade deals where the UK is involved or to cancel, uh, put in pressure uh, in the UK to negotiate and cancel the debt in global South countries. Join anti-war movements because war is always uh, provoking hunger. Uh, and uh, and also the always the the most marginalized people are um, suffering the consequences and and then yeah um, the, that's it uh, just uh, if you want to read more I have left some link for for later and I can share the links to the report and other um, take action links um, thank you very much and I hope I didn't I kept myself in the fifteen minutes.